Hello, everybody. Welcome to the show. Very excited. Again, we're into our second season, is the way we look at it. Um, this is a co presentation of the Classic TV Preservation Society, which is a nonprofit organization that is dedicated to the positive influence of classic television shows. A core function of the Classic TV Preservation Society are the TV and Self Esteem Seminars that we bring to schools and colleges and community centers and senior centers and business facilities all over the country. And it's really neat because we get to talk with individuals who are really who grew up with the shows, the original um, during the original viewings, and then new viewers uh, who are finding um, these programs on, show, on networks like Cozy TV and uh, what else we got Antenna TV and Me TV and Hallmark Channel even certainly has been a very a huge supporter of classic television. Anyway, uh, we have a very special guest tonight, and before oh, before we get to that uh, guest. Um, I'd like to, I, I was at the Collector Show, or excuse me, the Cinecon uh, Film Festival, Classic Film Festival last week um, at the Egyptian. And they have, you know, like the dealer rooms or whatever. And I, I came across a um, commencement speech um, by David Wolper, huge um, television producer, star producer. Right? One of his most important productions, and I believe this is correct, was Roots, which became one of the most historic miniseries of all times. So I, I came across it, I had to purchase it, and what he wrote at that speech just spoke to me personally. It spoke to what the Classic TV Preservation Society is all about. And I just wanted to read a little bit. I know, and he wrote it four years ago. Um, so I just want to read a little bit of it uh, because it's just, it's just phenomenal. So if you could just bear with me a little bit while I set this up, set it up, I'll like, sit down and get this paper put it in my hand. Um, and I'm just going to jump around because <clears throat> it you know, goes on forever. And by the way, what I really love about tonight is having one guest. It's going to be one focus so we can talk about everything. All right. <clears throat> this is David Wolper. I think that's how you say his name. He wrote probably 1975, 1976, somewhere around there, 77. I believe strongly that television audiences want to be educated and informed that they just crave information. Why not transmit the information in the form and arena that mass audiences want to receive it in by way of Charlie's Angels, All in the Family, Little House on the Prairie, Quincy, MASH, these are all classic TV shows. Let's use those shows to help in the educational process. Let's use those shows as our form to transmit ideas of a socially significant nature. Why not explore the problems of old age on an episode of the Rockford Files, or investigate drug abuse on Starsky and Hutch? Problems of alcoholism could be examined in an episode of Charlie's Angels, and a woman's life after divorce can easily be included in an episode of Laverne and Shirley. The recent miniseries, the recent at that time, transmitted a uh, Holocaust transmitted to over 100 million people a better understanding of that tragic event. Eleanor and Franklin gave us an insight into the meaning and contributions of the lives of those two historic people. Eleanor and Franklin was a miniseries. In Roots, the most watched television program of all time, and I think it still is, reached over 250 million people throughout the world, telling the background and history of slavery through the eyes of Alex Haley's Ancestors. Alex Haley was the um, author of the novel that series is based on. More people were educated about slavery during those eight days and 12 hours than in all the books and lectures in the past 200 year history of this country. There are so many things that can be done on the popular television show, on popular television shows. So many people can be touched and it can be done with taste and understanding in an entertaining fashion. Let's not fall into the notion that quality diminishes in direct proportion to popularity because it's just not true. We can be successful in disseminating more information and improve the quality and the value of television by convincing networks to include on a regular basis information and socially significant themes in the current popular television shows of the day. Television is the most influential, influential means of propagating ideas in this country today. It is instantaneous in its reach and intimate in its reception. 
It can exercise the most extraordinary sensory, sensory and emotional appeal. It molds minds, fixes modes of perception, and determines what is thought of as desirable and even real for millions of people. The students are out there, a hundred million of them yearning for information. I humbly suggest this is one way to reach them. Thank you. I mean, isn't that amazing? He, I applaud, please. He wrote that, you know, all those years ago. And yes, sir. Just to qualify what you said, I want to write on your parade here. Herb. Okay, fine. We'll cut it. Just to fine. qualify what David L. Wolper was saying. Yes. It's his own background. Not only did he do Roots, but he went on to do the Thornbirds. But the educational aspect of his background, he brought the world, the undersea world of Jacques Cousteau. Oh my gosh, yes. So, I mean, Even though it preempted Bewitched every, every time. <laughs> so, he, uh, he had the qualifications to say that. Yes. Oh, Thank of you. course. Of course. Thank you, Brad. Wow. Um, so let's have a hand for all of that. But seriously, when I picked it up, you know, at that in the dealer room that day, I'm like, did I write this? Did somebody take this from me? So, <laughs> kind of amazing. All right, um, we're gonna move on to uh, introducing my wonderful, wonderful guest. Sound, sound like Lawrence Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. <Hi>, Bubbles. <laughs> That's done. <laughs> um, I think all of us had a crush on her on, on Saturday mornings growing up in the in the 70s. Um, she brought to her role as Holly on Land of the Lost something that was very accessible, that was so real, that was um, so telling, so honest, and um, just so likable. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Kathy Coleman. Kathy, so nice to meet you. Oh, uh, you have a seat here. It smells so pretty. All right, oh, thank you. take that microphone. You know who doesn't like this perfume? Who? Chaka. Oh. <laughs> and someone just said, I, I told Chaka. you, someone just said, um, did she play Chaka on Land of the Lost? Not me, you. Oh, I thought you said, did I play it? No, no. <laughs> someone just asked me if I played this. Right, right, right. <laughs> So you wrote a book, and we're going to get into that. Okay. Okay. Um, but in general, what was the experience um, like playing Holly on Land of the Lost? In general, we'll start there. Okay. Let's see. Um, I never had a series before, so um, I didn't really know what to expect. I'd done some commercials, and I had been in a band for a couple of years, and so I was. I was okay to entertain. I, I that was just like a natural for me. If if somebody would look at me and give me an audience for just even a second, it was dun 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 dun. dun you know, I was all into it. So I was okay with that. I wasn't nervous or anything. I just didn't know what the daily grind was going to be, what was going to be expected of me, um, and I I didn't I didn't have an understanding that this was going to become like another family for me and it it really was and it wasn't just the father the brother and Chaka it was also the slee stacks and the other Pakuni and the prop master and the camera guys and the makeup man it was like where I hung out all the time between him and the prop guy and uh, just everybody on the set became like this big gigantic family for me and uh, I came from a big family I'm, I'm the youngest of 10 kids and a single mom and uh, it was just uh, it was it was a terrific experience um, I what do you recall of uh, your audition or how did, that, on, how did that all happen it was just like every every week you know I'd be in school and, and I'd come home and my mom would say you have an interview today and so it could be for anything, a, a, a pilot for a, a new series or what have you, or a commercial or anything. And so I would go on these interviews. Well, that day it was for Land of the Lost. And it's funny because the week before, um, I went on an interview for a show called Run, Joe, Run. I don't know if anybody ever saw that show. But it was down to Christy McNichol and I 
after they had seen everybody for the callbacks and stuff. Is that Bert, Bert Reynolds? Is it Bert Reynolds? No, yeah. no, it was about a German Shepherd. Oh, no, okay. Shepherd. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, so uh, she wound up getting it, and had I, and it filmed that next week, and it was just one episode. And had I uh, got that episode, I wouldn't have been able to audition for Land of the Lost, and you know the rest is history on that. But I did go on seven interviews callbacks I had to meet with uh, the rest of the cast that they had picked to see if we all like you know got along and we had chemistry and I had to meet with the presidents of like NBC and the director and everybody you know they all kind of wanted well what was it do you think in you that they saw that they liked and did they tell you that yet? did they tell you why you got the part or well, because I'm just so awesome. No, no, no actually, <laughs> no, actually, it's kind of funny because you wouldn't know it today because my voice is so deep. But back then, I had this really high pitched voice. And uh, David Gerald, who was the creator, um, he was uh, he wrote for Star Trek: Trouble with Tribbles. Um, anyway, so he was the creator of Land of the Lost, and. Uh, he told Marty Croft, he said, oh, that kid's voice. He said, I just can't take another <laughs> second of it. He goes, I don't know if I'm going to be able to sit in the control room and listen to that pitch of, well, you know, I just can't do it. And uh, Marty said, yeah, but he goes, other than that, he goes, I, I love the kid. He goes, it's just that voice. And Marty told him, he says, I'll take care of the voice. I'll handle that. And so apparently the first day on the set, I hit one of those high notes, and they all came running out of the control booth. You know? so, anyway, um, I guess I learned to control my, my high pitchness to some degree. But well, it was one of your anyway. Think, they you know it was one really, of your likable likable aspects. I think I think it, that's what it was. Just who I was. Yeah. I, I I didn't have like a. I was a singer, so I did have some voice control, but I mean, I was just a kid. Right. I was a kid, and I'm sure there were times when I was on the stage that they probably cut my mic if I hit a sour note. But, you know, <laughs> I was a kid. So, now, you know, a lot of child stars, and former child stars, they have had their challenges. And I, I'm a sensing that's the reason what brought you to write your book, which, by the way, is called Lost Girl. The truth, nothing but the truth. So help me, Kathleen. Mm -hmm. So explain how you came to write the book, why you decided to write the book, and then we'll get into the book. Okay. Um, there was a pattern that I, I noticed. Uh, it started when I was um, on the Dinosaur Show when I was about 12, I guess. It was pretty fresh into having the show. And I got on the show and she said, oh, I bet you the kids at school just love you. I bet you're really popular. And I said, no, because <laughs> I wasn't. I wasn't popular. I mean, everybody knew who I was, but they didn't like me because I didn't make sense to them. I, I, was, I was different and I, and I lived in a town that, that didn't have other kids that were in the industry. I lived in Simi Valley at the time. And uh, the reason I, I lived there was because of my mother who made a promise to me if I ever got a television series that she would get me a pony. And she stayed true to her word and she got me my pony. And because I had now a horse, I needed to live in a place that was zoned for horses and that was Simi Valley. So um, I, I was in and out of school. I would go to school, public school, during hiatus, and, and the kids didn't, they didn't know what to make of me, and people would say to me, oh, they're just jealous, you know, they're just jealous. And, and, and I always felt bad for the kids that, that the adults would put that label on them, and it made me feel awkward, because I knew it wasn't that they were jealous. It was the curiosity and the confusion that was really what was causing them to be so damn mean to me, you know? They didn't know any better. I was, a, I was an oddity to them. 
I, I was this person who was on television and, and I came and I went and, and, uh, and, and, and I didn't fit in. I, I, I was used to being around adults my entire life, pretty much adults. I was the youngest in my family, so everybody, there was like, some of my siblings are a good 15 years older than I am, so I lived in a very adult world at home and I lived in an adult world when I went to work. So, and it's interesting um, you say that because I think there was, you were a very adult Holly. I think that was the other thing too. It wasn't like you were a, a kid kid. You, you were an old soul and I think we saw that um, in, in the series. So it's interesting that you just well, said Well, because I think we were poor in the sense that we were, we were super rich in the fact that my mother provided us with more than I think most wealthy families had as far as trips that we went on, camping trips, and and simple things that were fun. I, I mean, I have, I know I wrote in the book about some of these tragic things that happened to me in my life, and they're just to kind of share with people that, you know what, I was stupid. I did dumb things, and I tolerated things in, in my life, but, you know, it's more so to show you that we're really kind of all in this together, you know, we all try so to So the issues or the challenges that you had weren't necessarily bred because of Hollywood, it's just that because you were in Hollywood, everything you did was only exacerbated or because you were in the public eye, it wasn't really any different than others. I don't think so. People used to say to me, oh, you know, did you ever have like a drug problem or anything? And I said, they, you know, because you were a child star, and I said, no different than than the newspaper boy, you know? As a matter of fact, I think we got our stuff from the newspaper boy, you know? I mean, and, and I have, in my life, I have lived in, in the wealthiest of families, and, and lived in the poorest of families, and everything in between, every color, every creed, every nation, I have been a part of their lives to some degree, and it's across the board. I mean, my, my first husband that I had my children with, his family are the founders of Bel Air, California. That's like this old money and old way of thinking. And they had seven boys, and there wasn't one Puritan in the bunch. They were all, you know, they all should have books like mine, you know? So. Well, let's, let's get into the book. And, and I really do love um, the style. That, that that you wrote it in, <clears throat> and I'll just to give one truth. Reason. Well, truth, <laughs> but but the you write well is what I'm uh, saying. Thank it's you. um this in this little paragraph really signifies it. I think um you're talking about your mom. Mm -hmm. You're uh, my this is her speaking now writing. My mother was very young and naive. I have compassion for her for a lot of that. She seemed to be just constantly out of place. She'd come on the set of Land of the Lost. And it was always, you know, excuse me, uh, lighting coming through, cable coming through, etc. She just always managed to be standing in the wrong spot. I think she must have felt that way in life, always in the wrong spot. I mean, that's just so nicely presented. And really, it's the it's the core of of, of the book. Your relationship with your mom was was a was a setting theme. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, so oh, she was a huge part of my life. I spent a, um, a probably more intimate time with her than I think any of my other siblings. I, I she she came on tour with me when I was in the band for the two years I traveled, and uh, she was on the set with me every day. Um, my other sisters went through puberty and things like that, and. They just kind of did it behind like closed bedroom doors, like you know, when they started to become women and stuff. And my mother was like very hands on. I mean, every single change that that took place in my life, she was you know watching it. So she was um, she was very much a part of my everything, my diet. You know, the other kids. Um, I come from a pretty much heavy family. Everyone's you know, a good 50 or more overweight. And I um, I wasn't ever going to be that way because I had a different father. And I did not know that until I was 18 years old. Okay, so, so break that down. Break down the siblings, how many you have, and 
and the differences? Well, there's, there's, um, there's six of us still living, three boys, three girls. And how many were there originally? Ten. Wow. My mom lost her first baby. Anyway, um, so, uh, yeah, so, you know, this whole thing, this diet thing that she had me on when I was growing up um, was unnecessary. And so there was this, like, lie going on, and it was very odd. Yeah, Are you, it, was a, it was a lie that, that I felt when I finally found out the truth. It saddened me because she had been hiding this truth about me being different and, and, and tr treating me so oddly <laughs> that um, I felt bad for her because she was all I ever knew. And I loved her, you know. I didn't know who the father was. I didn't know who the one that they said might be, you know. I didn't know anybody. I just knew her. And um, you think that was the seeds of why you started to um, drink? In so mm, actually, I I think I had lived under such control growing up that. By the time I turned 18 and got that trust fund and my brand new Mustang, it was just like, I just went like wild. I didn't have to weigh in every day. I didn't have to. And what year was this? Just clarify. When I was 18. Well, it was 70. Oh, 1980. 1980, I turned 18. And uh, I probably got my money too. But you know what? It, it, you can. Say I probably shouldn't have got my money when I did. Maybe wait until I was in my 30s or something. You know, it's just, it's life. It all came the, when it was supposed to come and I learned all my lessons. And some of them were, um, I, I, you know, I was a little thick in the skull, I guess. I had to get really bashed over my head to really get it through me, you know? So Land of the Lost was canceled after three years and what year, what year did it end? 76. Okay, so what was going on with your career after the show ended? Um, actually, I was, gonna, I was getting ready to turn 15, and uh, there's not a lot of work in the industry from 15 to 18. Uh, they can get somebody that's 18 that looks 15, you know, that's, that's easy, so... Um, did you, it have, was, did you have I, trouble I, getting work after Land of the Lost? I'm just trying to see if, if there was some path to, you know, again, uh, you reaching out and, and trying to find comfort in, in other things. Um, no, what, well, I, was, I just wasn't getting sent out a lot, you know, because my age and already, they weren't calling on me because of my age. They, these people that would have called me would have known how old I was, so I wouldn't go out on as many interviews as, as I used to go out on. Um, I kind of became a little unworkable. And so, but I did, which was the craziest thing. When I was almost 18 years old, like 17 and, and 11 months or something, um, <laughs> I got a series of Burger King commercials. And, uh, and it was weird, because we went in, in groups of four on the audition, and they pulled three girls from one group and they pulled me from a different group. And these girls were all like 21. And I was, you know, 17 and 11 months and I got the job singing with them, as a matter of fact. <laughs> so. Um, you, you met a lot of stars. I mean, either through. Oh, a ton. Your, your pop, ton. talk about some of the like, oh, well, was it Elton John? And... Well, my mother actually met him. Oh. <laughs> She met him on the parking in the parking lot of the of Land of the Lost. Anyway, she was funny because she came in. She said, "Oh, I met the nicest guy, crazy looking, you know." And my mom had this really beautiful Australian accent. It was very musical when she'd speak. She said, "Nutty as a loon, the way he looked, you know." And <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I I remember um, when I was about ten. Uh, I could have been 11, but I was on the, I was at the Schubert Theater and I had Burt Bacharach on one hand and George Burns on the other 
and Helen Reddy, I think, might have been on Burt Bacharach's other hand. And I was with, and my band members were there as well. And we were belting out, I am woman. And, and it just made me laugh, because hold the kids ears. But I didn't have. <laughs> you can tell me. <laughs> anyway, I didn't have one pubic hair. Oh, okay. And I'm screaming, I am woman here, you know. And it was just very funny at the time. We were all laughing so hard. <laughs> um, Sorry. So tell, tell us about my favorite celebrity that when you met Elizabeth Montgomery, or at least you saw her. What happened uh, that day? Oh my goodness, was now that up, ever so. so much fun. I, um, I just think that she was just the everything woman. I just think she was just everything. And, and the true sensualness to me of a human being or the attractiveness of them is somebody that behind their eyes has a secret and it shines through that secret of they know something about life that's so exciting that just glows they just glow because they've got that paul mccartney has it that's that secret like he's that's why he's so charming because he's just got a secret so anyway i met the um i'm in century city once again and it's an nbc press party and uh there's all kinds of celebrities. I, I had stepped outside of it, got thrown out, couldn't get back in. Uh, Hogan's Heroes, um, Bob, Crane. Bob Crane dragged me back in, helped me out. He goes, come on, kids, you can come in with me. you know. And I said, no, I'm really supposed to be in here. And he said, I know. He says, I've got your, uh, your show on VHS, which is, that's how long ago this was. So anyhow, so I go in there after Bob Crane pulls me back in. And I see this circle of men, very, very attractive men, all in nice clothes and everything. And I look in what their circuit, what their, what's in the middle of their circle, and there's Elizabeth Montgomery. And I just stood there just watching her and just watching how she charmed and entertained all of these men simultaneously. There wasn't one in the group that she, that didn't think that he was the one of the group that made her day. She just was able to just give it to everybody equally. And I thought, you are one heck of a woman. I would love to be like you someday. And instead, I learned to be like me. And I'm uh But well, you I'm still happy. captured all, all of us. Well, like I said, Ed, we all had crushes on you. I mean, you were just, uh, you were adorable. Still are. So yeah, back. Um, I just want to end that one that one story that I was talking about about. Um, uh, I forget where we were, but anyway. Before Elizabeth Montgomery. Before, you, before <laughs> well, that. Yeah, it was way before Elizabeth Montgomery. Back up the tape. It, no, no, no. It's okay. It was just what I wanted to say though was that um, somewhere. Why I guess all these. When I, I know what it was, I said that, that some of the lessons that I had to learn, you know, because I had a thick skull, I had to have my head bashed in a few times to finally get it through my thick skull. Um, one of them that was really hard for me was that somehow, somewhere, when I was a little kid, somebody told me that um, I wasn't valuable or something something to that effect, that I bought hook, line, and sinker, like, oh, she's fine. People used to say that to me all the time, she'll be fine. And they just sort of just thought I could just handle everything. And that kind of made me not stand up for myself in life. And so when I finally learned that I was very valuable, um, it changed everything. It changed everything. And I think that's like, in that book, if I can get that across it, I'm smiling. It's like I want everybody who's ever had those feelings that they're not good enough to just know, man, we got the seal of approval. You know those stickers in your shirts that say, you know, inspected by? We got the inspection from, you know, the big guy. And uh, I, I wear that proudly today. That's so beautiful. Do you realize that, I mean, just right now... The, the and I'm not crying because I'm sad. I'm happy. And we're, and we're happy to have you here. Completely happy. 
Please applaud. <laughs> but do you realize that you know the, the lives here that you're touching, just in this room, and then certainly when we when we show this on YouTube or whatever, not to mention the millions of lives, all the joy that you brought to so many lives. And I believe that when we leave this world, we get to take all of that joy with us to wherever we believe heaven is or how we're gonna define it. And we get to relive it again and again. So not only you know, do you, will you bring the joy that you experience in my view of things? Did you, do, will you bring the joy that you experienced in your show and in your life? But all the other stuff will be gone. And then you'll get to take with you the millions and millions and millions of, of joy, mom, joyful moments that you created with others. I think, you know? it's, I think it's very funny that you say that because I, I also believe that heaven is also on earth. And uh, at these conventions, I meet with the fans and they share their stories with me. And so that reliving, I'm actually being able to do that right here and now. And people that tell me, like people that before this, um, before this evening got started and I came up here, I was talking to some of the people in the audience and uh, we got to just share some really cool stuff. So yeah, oh God, it's, it's wonderful. Are you kidding me? That's why I continue to keep doing these shows. It's, it's not for the money. I mean, the money's, you know, it just pays for me to get there again, you know, to the next one, basically. Oh, I've got a collection of them. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Well, people know me, I guess. <laughs> What's that? No, that's Tracy. Thank you, Tracy. Will you come back next week and do that for everybody? <laughs> Tell me something. Um, do you believe that the struggles that you had even as a child and then later on as a, you know, a young adult and then an adult, does, did that contribute to your art as an actress? Are you a better actress? Were you a better performer on Land of the Lost because of the struggles that you went through? Did you use any of that? Well, for crying scenes, maybe, or emotional scenes, maybe. But as far as like the kind of tomboy type personality that I think Holly had and the didn't take any guff kind of personality, I mean, that was just who I was as a, as a kid. And uh, my sense of adventure, I, I mean, for me, I, had, I, I write a lot about some of the sad things that happened to me in my life and people say, oh God, I feel so bad for you. You know what, that's just some of the stuff. That's like not even, that doesn't even really touch on everything that I did in my life. I had so much fun and fun with like really simple things too, like my sister and I. We'd get a coffee can, and when we were camping, run down to the river and, and collect pollywogs all day. That, to me, and I feel sad for some of the kids today that don't get to have those simple, basic, tons of fun moments. In and out of the entertainment industry, in general. Yeah, yeah. I mean, those little, we got a little paper bag of our penny candies. We could sit down at that river all day long. It was a blast. Right. Because going for an ice cream has been a simple treasure like going for an ice cream or or just walking along the beach has been lost in iPads and, and smartphones. Right, and, and we were saying, you know, Saturday mornings used to be something that you went to school all week long, your parents worked all week. Come Saturday morning, they were in bed, they were zoned out because they worked so hard all week long. And so that became your very private moment on and, you know, you got your bowl of Cocoa Puffs and you, you know, had at it, you know, in front of the TV. It was your moment. Today, there's Pop just hearts. so much, yeah, whatever <laughs> floats your boat. I always now say whatever floats your raft. <laughs> um, in a raft. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, the kids have so many options today. There's too just, many, too yeah, many. Yeah, it, it's... So it what's the answer? Which how, one? Can, how can we simplify <laughs> things? I mean, okay. I mean, now they're trying to shut, you know, they have like shut off days or, you know, non-smartphone days and all of that, dewire yourself, whatever the phrase is. Unplug. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> dewire. I, I think it's, it's, it's like our diets is portion control, you know, the way that we eat. 
You know, you, you can't, you can have pizza, you can have ice cream, you can have all of that stuff, but you know, you can't have it Monday through Friday every night, you know, but how about once a week and we do that? The same thing I think should be with entertainment for your children and how you spend time with them is portion control. If they want to play with the computer, you sit down with them and you both learn stuff because your kids, because they've morphed into computer wizards right out of the chute these days, they um, can teach you things. And so just anything that you choose to do, to just do it together and then put the computer down. And today it's fishing or camping or hiking or, you know, let's do some artwork, you know, even if you don't know how to do it, both of you sit there and just struggle together to figure something out, you know? That deserves Cook. applause. Thank you very much. Do anything. Spend some time with your kids, you know, like my mother did. It, there's no excuse, well, we don't have the money. My mother had nothing. She had nothing, and all those kids, yet she provided us with so much on so, so little. Amazing. You know, all the odds against her, too. She, she struggled with, you know, being here in this country. She came here when she was young, and and her dream kind of shattered with her romance. You know, she married a soldier and came here and she thought she was gonna be the, you know, the, the cat's meow in his eyes and, and she wasn't. She, you know, she, her heart was broken and so she put all of her energy and her love into something, you know, positive, which she was smart to switch gears, you know, when you need to in life. Yeah, she adapted. Yeah. Which, which you have as well. Would you say you have adapted through your life? Absolutely. I'm a chameleon. <laughs> um, okay. Why don't we open the floor up? Okay. And uh, take some questions. Bump up the lights, as Carol Burnett used to say. I like saying that every time. <laughs> so uh, if you have any questions for um, our wonderful guests, please raise your hand and don't be shy. Yes, sir. <clears throat> when did the book come out? In April. Have you been doing book tours? No, but I have been bringing them to the shows, to the conventions. Yeah. So, yeah. It sounds like a good read. Oh, you don't have to read it. It's a great one. It's awesome. <laughs> would you Honest. Like, would you like to do more book tours? Absolutely. I would like to get it into the hands of as many people as I possibly could. Absolutely. So that when, you know, if I ever run into you, we can have like a good laugh. Like, I don't remember that one thing you said. You know what? I did the exact same thing and I thought it was just me. No, you know what? We're all very similar. So. Yes, Frank. I was just thinking what a great first series experience that was as a young actor. You worked with all sorts of different characters and creatures. What was it like doing like special effects shots where they put a dinosaur in? Was that particularly challenging to act as a young actor without someone to play against? As far as um, a first show to be on, there wasn't, for a kid, there wasn't a better set to be on than my set. It, we had two sound stages and it was caves and ponds and, and all kinds of stuff going on. Um, when it came to the special effects, when we had dinosaurs involved and things like that, um, I was on a, a wall that was about twice the height of this ceiling and uh, about as wide as, I don't know, half this room. And uh, we, it was called chroma key, and now they call it a green screen, but it was about the color of your t-shirt right there. We, you know, spent half the day on chroma key, so. Nothing green about that blue. No, I know, but they, it's now green, but it used to be chroma key blue. Yes, Brett. Mentioned the two sound stages. Where was Land of the Lost? Uh, the first uh, two seasons, it was at, uh, it was called General Services on uh, Santa Monica and Las Palmas. Now Hollywood uh, Center Studios. Yes, uh, yes. Okay. And uh, Glen Glen Sound was right behind us, and we used to do our looping there. Yeah. And uh, the third season was over at Samuel Goldwyn. Okay. It was all done on video. Yes, compact video. Wow. Yeah. So did you all get together with like the Lidsville people and the HR Puff and Stuff people and have a big party, or was it it was a little bit after those shows, or or what? Um, did you interact with them? I saw them at press parties. Some of them. Um, we did a 
one time, because um, the Croft offices, their main like storage facilities and everything are in Sunland. And I remember they had one big party, and it was at the time when they were producing the Brady Bunch variety show, and Donnie and Marie, and all of that. So it was kind of a cool party, because it was like, there's Greg Brady. <laughs> you know? it, was, it was just weird, you know. And I try to tell that to people when I do these shows, by the way, about um, this whole oneness thing that, that I'm really all about, is that I know what it's like to be on this side of the the table, and I know what it's like to be on that other side of the table. And I just think, I mean, I don't know if I, if you guys are fans of mine or what to, how do you even say that without sounding like a, you know. We're not. fans. Okay. But, but I just think if, like, for me, like, if I could have, like, come to something like this or gone to a convention and met David Cassidy, I was like, I'd have been, like, out of my mind. I'd have been so, so happy. Back then, you you know the celebrities were you know on the television and right. unless you were part of the they weren't accessible. As not as at as all. all, not at all. I mean, I got to meet some of them because I was in the business. Like uh, Leif Garrett was one of my crushes, and I actually got to date him when we were kids. When we were kids, How's he doing? <laughs> I haven't talked to him in many years, but uh, my friend Chaka sees him at um, parties once in a while. How was it like going to school in your junior high school years when you were filming? Oh, you came in late. Um, we already <laughs> talked about that, yeah. But you already know because you went to school with me, so therefore I don't need to. <laughs> These two girls in the back here, um, they went to junior high school with me. So they loved you. You, you did have friends, then. I, oh, I did have friends. I had, I had a few friends. You get her the hell out of school and go horseback riding. Oh. Yeah. She was, a Jill. She was our, one of our supporters. You know, you'd rather have four quarters than a hundred pennies. <laughs> Sweet. Do, I, do you have a question? Oh, yeah. I wanted to ask you about the uh, movie they made. The Will Ferrell movie. Will Ferrell movie, and fans have different opinions about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and you and you talk about this in in the book. So you know what, why it didn't, why I think it didn't succeed too, because I related to that book. We'll talk. About that. Yeah. Okay, is your question? <laughs> did I like it? Am I, am I? Which side of the fence am I on on this? Um, that and possibly if if you could wave a wand and redo it, what would you have mm -hmm. changed? I would have liked to have directed the the movie Land of the Lost, not necessarily the Will Ferrell movie, but just the movie when the when Land of the Lost became a motion picture. I would have loved the job of directing that because I think that what what fans what wanted to see is like when you go camping. Um, you, you arrive Friday night and, and all you have time to do is quickly set up the tent and um, you know the next morning you start adjusting where the, the ice chest should go because at night you didn't know that the sun was going to be beating right on that. And so there you start to, as you're staying there over the weekend, you start to make your campsite a little more homey. Well, if we were in Land of the Lost for 40 years, don't you think I would have possibly had like a slee stack skin backpack or, you know, not because we killed them or hunted them, but just one might have keeled over from time to time, you know? We would have evolved, and I think it would have been neat to see, you know, what we did. Did we, how did we decorate our lives? Being there 40 years, what did we discover? You know, and I think they, they just bypassed all of that and and turned it into this spoof, which I don't believe Land well, of Lost was spoofable. Unfortunately, whenever classic TV shows are remade for the big screen, for one reason or another, the people involved feel they have to make a joke out of it. Even when Starsky and Hutch a few years back was brought to the screen, they had to make a joke out of it. So they don't know, for some reason, they don't know how to make it just a straight adaptation. Now, and the there's way, plenty enough about just a regular family that could be very funny, you know? Well, but, but the whole thing is what made Land of the Lost great is that there was a logic within that illogic of that world. Whatever happened in, the, in that world made sense. It was written so well. And it wasn't a joke. 
It wasn't a, a comedy. It was some, some of those episodes, most of those episodes, were better written than some of the primetime series at the time. So it wasn't a joke. The way I look at it, it was a it was a well done. No, that's series. what I mean. I don't, you know, the Brady Bunch, because it had more of an adult audience, could be a spoof spoofable film. But Land of the Lost was it was a kids show, and it was about family and and morals, and and it wasn't something that I think you you step on no. and and laugh at. Right. But like I said, I think that there's humor in families. There, if they wanted to bring in some comedy relief, right. there there was plenty of room to do it, but they didn't have to do it in that way. Right. Which is what you did on the show as well. You had comedy relief, certainly, on the series. Right. But it, but it was a natural progression of the characters. What about the, the remake that was in the 90s, The Land of the Lost TV Show? You know, I, I think I caught maybe 15 minutes of one episode. Um... I had auditioned for that as well, and uh, they just like within like with the film, we had did a cameo by the way in the Will Ferrell film, and they cut it out. They had four different endings, and they decided to go with the one that they went with. But um, they also, when I auditioned, I thought for sure I was going to be cast, and they opted to go with that jungly-looking brunette girl who wasn't even, like, a Holly character at all. She was a... Didn't they put you through a lot of, uh, a lot of measuring and all these other... And that, was for Will, that was for the Will Ferrell film. Um, yeah, they, they sent out a wardrobe uh, department to measure me and, and all of this, and then they sent me all my sides, and when I got on the set, they said, you have no, you have no lines. And anyway, that was a, that's a whole other subject matter. Um, so, so the Land of the Lost TV show, the remake, was similar, more similar to the original series than the movie was to the original series, right? Yeah, but there was a, an SUV involved, and it, it was, it wasn't Land of the Lost. Most people don't even, they, they vaguely, they say, wasn't there a show after your show? And I say the Will Ferrell movie, and they go, no, that one that was in between, and they can't, they can't pinpoint really what it was about. And even you had said to me, the, the SUV thing or whatever, you know, they had a Bronco or something. Okay. Yes. Well, I have another one. Uh, the, the the whole Slee stack philosophy, the Altruzian, uh, whatever it was, I can't remember the term, the crystals, all of that was mm -hmm. that based on. Something like uh, Eastern or New Age philosophy, or was it just a writer's imagination? An Eastern philosophy? Um, boy, that's a that's a good question. I I don't know if it was an Eastern philosophy, but it was a. It was all those Star Trek writers. I don't know. Well, yeah, I would say to. yes because at, at the time, I mean, we had Kung Fu. Um, on TV, and Kung Fu debuted in 1972, uh, right when uh, President Nixon was holding historic talks with Chairman Mao. So that show introduced the mainstream to Asian thought. So I would say... Well, yeah, yeah, because he did, he talked about, um, you know, what what would become of, of his people, his Lee Stack, the Enoch character, would say, you know, is that what you're referring to? Yeah, he would he would say you know that if this type of behavior continues, you know there right. will you know wind up destroying ourselves and right. so yeah yeah I guess I guess so. I just never thought of it in that sense but because Enoch kind of sounds like the Book of Enoch which if you go into that realm that's yeah. kind of like crystals and all that philosophy and yeah, metaphysicalness and things like that so Enoch it was it was a very it was a mystical show. And, and but usually, you those hidden underpinnings. Maybe that's what you're. I don't know. Well, you said Star Trek writers that kind of clue in. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, it, Star Trek was uh, very mystical too. But usually, when science fiction and fantasy cross, or when science fiction and supernatural cross in the same show, it doesn't work. But it worked well because the show was. It made sense. They made it, made it work within the realm of that show's understanding. It was just very well done. DC Fontana, right? What wrote one of your favorite episodes? Uh, Elsewhere. Elsewhere. Now talk talk a little bit about that. Why why is that your favorite? Oh well, because this woman not only um, 
was she like important to me as a a role model in the sense that in my family I, I didn't have like a girly girl type woman as a sister. I um, I had these different types of sisters, and she was very feminine, and she liked all the feminine things like hair and makeup and fashion, and she liked those things, and she was just she was just a different kind of a woman, and and I I just like uh, really bonded with her, and then um, off camera we became very good friends and she helped me through some difficult things in my life so um, okay. yeah I mean it, yeah, yeah. It, why is it my favorite episode yeah, it, yeah. well yeah because I, I became very good friends with her and uh, I just think it's a great story storyline as well yes yeah. so there's this um, I remember reading once that there were only three sleeve stag costumes. Is that true? I think it was four, but it could have <laughs> just been three. But there, there were, were like there were there were many different sleeve stags who wore them, or different right. people who wore them. Right. But it wasn't like there was like because I know with like the shots, it would look like there was like a bunch. You may of think there was an army of them chasing. Yeah. Right, yeah. but it was just the way it was shot. Right, like right. Really no, there was usually only three steps three of them on the set right. at, at one time. Right. But they were all like UCLA, USC <laughs> basketball players. <laughs> Bill Lambier was a was a slee stack <laughs> from the Detroit Pistons. Um, now, yes. I, mean, I was a fan of when I lost way back when, and I gotta say, I remember I had it cut out on the paper of, of you know, David Greenwood and John Lambert. Oh, wow. Back in, you know, like, when it was first on, I remember they were like 6'10". Right, so, right, and then when they were put in on the sleeve stack boots, yeah. had like a seven inch lift in them, <laughs> and then the point on the top of the head, I mean, these guys were... <laughs> they were almost... Yeah, because they had to, because I'm saying, well, that's something that the sleeve stacks were really, like, were really you know, they used, they had like three, like, they, they made the NBA, I mean... <laughs> you know, well, they, some of them had like million dollar contracts, I yeah. mean... <laughs> Yeah, because they were good enough to, to do it, but, but I mean, doing the sleeve stack thing, that was kind of like their first, kind of a part-time job. It didn't make very much. <laughs> no, 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 if you work for the crops, you never made that much. <laughs> well, and, and that was the really the only issue, if there was an issue, about the, the shows, is that they, they, what, the budget wasn't, wasn't large or expansive, but the stories were there, the writing was there. And the acting was there. You believed that these people were in that area because you guys did such a wonderful job. So if anyone says it was camp... Well, the, I can't think of the woman's name, but the woman who directed When Harry Met Sally about three years ago, she said that... Bob Ryder? <laughs> no, oh, woman. woman. Robin. Robin Ryder. Okay. Oh, you mean, oh, Nora Ephron. When Harry met Sally. No, a, I, that was, woman, I think that was Rob. It? That was Rob. Rob Ryan. Oh, well, okay, well, you're, maybe you're thinking of Nora Ephron, who was his partner who did other movies like that. Okay, so, maybe so, that's it. Anyway, so anyway, I saw her on, on, on TV about three years ago, and she started talking about how you're going to see that the, the A-listers are going to start moving back to the small screen because that's where the quality of writers and... Uh, the real work is. It's these big blockbuster films. You know, these, these people who really want to tell stories and stuff, they're not interested in that kind of work. And so I think that's what happened on Land of the Lost was there wasn't a lot of money, but it was just so interesting. You know, there were so many creative things going on that people just wanted to be a part of it, even at at a smaller pay scale. And it didn't matter because we, no, we just, we just love the show. On Star Trek, on the original Star Trek, I remember um, DeForest Kelly, who played Dr. McCoy, he used to talk about how the, um, you know, the, the thing that he would use to monitor, it was like a salt and pepper shaker from the NBC commissary, you know, that they would use. So even on that show, the budget, mm -hmm. budget was small, it was prime time. Okay, yes, more questions. Can you talk about any of your favorite directors? On the show or in general? Either. From the show first. Well, the first one that we had, Dennis Steinmetz, he went on uh, to do soap operas after, but he was fun. I enjoyed him. Bob Lawley, uh, who 
went on to uh, direct the Jeffersons. Uh, he was a lot of fun. We, I think we had about six or seven different directors, and they each brought a little something special to the show when we worked with them. Do they have acting coaches for you guys? I mean, did, was that part of the, the setup? No. No. Did you ever want one? <laughs> <laughs> on the set? She was a natural. Yeah. No, they just, you know, I, I went home every night with my script, and uh, I'd stay up very late memorizing my lines, come back in and they'd say, stand over there, run in there, grab that, come back, sit down, and say all of this and while you're doing all of that. And I just did it. Okay. You know, no. So you did things instinctively that maybe some actors have to train for? Yeah, I, I mean, I was just, you know, I was just there. I just, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't know if you have to train to sit down somewhere. It's just, you know, that's yeah, where we really sat. So. Yes. Did you ever get back into your music career? I did some singing in my early 20s. Uh, but no, no, not really. Oh, I, I d I've done some mad karaoke. <laughs> Oh, that's right, that's right. Yeah. I'm not here. Yes, about uh, directing us. I'm going to ask about writers. Do you have any, like, writers, movies, you know, thinks a good writer has been over the past few years, or you know, when you look at, hey, they've done some good stuff, or... Well, that's interesting, because Brad Sieberling, who, well, he wasn't a writer, I'm sorry, he was a director. <laughs> okay, well, he he did uh, City of Angels. Yeah. Was it City? It's City of Angels with um, yeah, yeah. Meg Ryan yeah. and Nicolas Cage, right? Um, anyway, he was the one who directed the Will Ferrell version of Land of the Lost. But when I, I went in to meet him on my first meeting with him, and I was so excited that it was going to be him because I loved City of Angels. I thought, oh, this guy is so metaphysical and so, like, open-minded about so many things. And when I met him in our interview, he was so, like, warm and, and open. And he sat there with me, and he's just, like, really, like, real neat. Like a neat kind of a guy, like the kind I, I can gel with. And then on the set, he... It just all of that just disappeared and he produced this and I thought god boy that that took me by surprise it's probably the studio you know telling him what to do with the movie more than you know. how how did Sid and Marty Croft what do they think of the movie well I I haven't heard really anything out of Sid but Marty says that he he really does want to do land of the lost like how he wanted to do it I think it's just the whole money thing, you know. It's just—it's tough. Because it's—it's tough. Cause it's, it's really not essentially about creativity. It's always about the money more times than not. And what people will never get through their thick skulls is that the money will come. Put the put the the richness in the product, and the money will follow. I say right now would be a great time because now with the popularity of Jurassic World, I mean that dinosaur theme would be a great time to really make a push to. It, and it's possible, because they remade The Incredible Hulk only a couple years after that first film. So it is possible to just get right back on the horse. Well, I can tell you or that David that. Gerald, who, <laughs> who I said, I told you guys early in the evening that he was the creator, um, it would take somebody like him, who really had an understanding of what the original show was all about, to rewrite a new storyline. And he's about 50% done with Land of the Lost, the book. And when that's completed, he will turn that into a screenplay. And the Crofts mentioned this at Comic-Con a few months back. And David had mentioned it in front of like 6,000 people at the Star Trek convention a couple of years ago. So when he pulled us, Wesley, the brother, and I he pulled us on stage, and he made that announcement in front of a lot of people. So. But here's, this is like such, such cool stuff. We had a sibling. That's his storyline. We had a little 
brother mm -hmm. that you know in every family there's always that young one that the mother says you know you can go next year you know they're they're gonna go and it'll come your turn you'll be old enough maybe you know by next year and you can go on a rafting trip with them anyway 40 years later he um, comes looking for us in the land of law so we will be myself um, and Wesley and Chaka, the original cast, will be in the new film. Yeah. Very exciting. I think it's so cool that we had a sibling. It's just, you know, like I said, it, it would take somebody who knew the, the dynamics of it from the get-go to come up with that, you know? Wow, cool. Isn't that neat? That is awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. You brought up Wesley. He was kind of a heartthrob back in the day. Oh, yeah. Was, was there anything on the set between you and him? <laughs> no. No, yeah. He was, he was a, he's like 10 years older than I am, and that makes a major difference when you're that age, you know? Yeah. My boyfriend today is 10 years older than me, and it makes no difference. There's no difference. But when you're 12 and the other person's, you know... And you had, you had, there was issues that you had just like with your real family. You talked about that in the book that, you know, you wanted the bigger limo and you got, he got the little limo or. Oh, no, no, that was just when we were doing the, um, uh, the uh, narration on the videos for the, the box set that you guys have, you have, you have. Um, yeah, I just happened to get a bigger limousine than him. So, oh, as far as, like, uh, um, there wasn't any, like, I didn't have a crush on him. You had mentioned him being a heartthrob. Nothing like that. As a matter of fact, Chaka and I were closer in age, and he had a crush on me, and so, but we hung out together. I just thought he was, like, a friend, because I didn't see that. I didn't see that he had a crush on me. I just thought that we were friends. But apparently, he has told me, you know, of course, years later that he did, and da 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 da. Anyway. Um, now, was that Paley? Is that his name? Yeah, Philip Paley. Phil, now, is, was he related to Paley of CBS? No, no. But um, we did, oh, banter back and forth, Wesley and I. Oh, big time. He, and he's the one who taught me, like, he was a camera hog. Because he was older and experienced, and he knew like how to get that last close up, you know. And so he pushed me into the bushes, and he turned around, and 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 we had this ongoing game where, you know, we'd start ad libbing after the lines, all the dialogue had been said. He'd have to turn around and say, "Yeah, that was good, Holly." And so I, I let it slide for a while, and then it was like, really, Will? Thanks. And I started ad-libbing myself, and then he'd say, yeah, it was. And so it was whoever could get the last line in before they <laughs> cut the tape. You know, so. I love it. I love it. And we're still like that. And by the way, I see um, the cast all the time, and we're very, very, very close. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Kathleen, thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. It was just such a, a pleasure having you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. This is super. Thank you, gonna, you so she's much. She's going to be signing books right over here, right next to me, where I'm going to be signing my Elizabeth Montgomery books as well. Um, thank you, guys. Next week, we have, um, who do we have? Oh, Gloria Loring. And in future weeks, Don Wells, Gilligan's Island, and Kathy Garver from Family Affair, and Anson Williams from Happy Days. So please stick with us, and uh, thank you very much. Peace. Yay. Oh, yes, sir. I was just wondering, uh, how can we contribute to the uh, classic television preservation? Thank you society? very <laughs> much. Good question. Thank you very much. You can contribute right tonight in that little plastic um, container. I, I uh, dedicate my life to the positive influence of classic TV. This is what I do. So whatever uh, contributions you can make would be would be lovely and appreciated. And if not, and by the way, thank you so much. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank I'll, you. I'll so um, God bless you all, and, and let's uh, 